Elizabeth Keckley was uh, an enslaved woman who lived in St. Louis uh, in the late 1840s. Uh, she is known in history as a dressmaker to both Verena uh, Howell Davis, who was Jefferson Davis's wife, president of the Confederacy, and then she became dressmaker to Mary Tad Lincoln uh, during the Lincoln administration. So she was a very well-respected uh, dressmaker uh, in her lifetime. Of course, she was a, known as a modiste, that she designed and made clothes. And if she were alive today, she would have been a couture designer. That's just how skillful she was. She was uh, born into slavery, of course. She uh, endured uh, many hardships uh, as she was growing up, and including all manner of abuse. Her mother was an enslaved woman. Her father was the person that owned them. Her mother had married another enslaved man named George Hobbs. As far as she was concerned, that was her, her father. She was often sent to other places to work and she had a child by another <laughs> white male, which was quite common during that time, and that was her only child. And she named him after her, her father, her, the man who she thought was her father. She named him George. Growing up as an enslaved woman, she was expected to mend things and produce clothing. She had a natural talent for it. And beyond that, she was also educated and you know, she could read and write, which was something that was forbidden by law for African Americans. So she was lucky in that aspect as well. She, she was educated and she had this natural skill. And so when her original owner died, Armistead Burwell, he left Elizabeth and her mother to his daughter. Her daughter had married a man by the name of Hugh Garland. Hugh Garland was an attorney. Uh, from Virginia. He was not a particularly successful attorney. Even according to Keckley in her own autobiography, talks about how he was not very good at business, uh, not very good at uh, taking care of him, himself and his family financially. So he decided he was going to come to St. Louis. A lot of people were moving west looking for their fortunes. When he's in St. Louis and he is in dire straits financially, he decides that probably the best way for him to make some extra income uh, is to rent out his slaves. Mr. Garland was going to hire her mother out, and she said she could not bear to see her mother, who had been this faithful servant uh, to, this, to these people, to just be put into the service of strangers. Elizabeth goes to Hugh Garland, and she proposes that she used her dressmaking skills as a means of support for his family. And she said that for about uh, over two years she had to support 17 people. And her business really kind of took off. Her services were much, much in demand. She developed a very uh, affluent clientele. Uh, she describes it, you know, the best ladies of St. Louis used her services. Elizabeth had the opportunity to buy herself out of slavery, to purchase her way out. And at first, Mr. Garland was, um, didn't, didn't really want to let her go. And according to her, he just said, well, here. He took out a coin and said, why don't you just take the ferry, go across to, to Illinois, and you'll be free then. And she said, well, no, that's not the way I'm, I want to do this. I want to do it according to the law. There were a group of women that uh, respected Elizabeth because of her dressmaking abilities, uh, respected her as a person. They saw her as a very intelligent, hardworking individual, and they helped her buy her way out of slavery. She accepted this, but she said, I'm not, it's not going to be a gift, it's going to be a loan, and I'm going to pay you back. And she did work and work and work, and she was able to pay back all that money was able to buy her freedom and that of her son. This happens in 1855. She becomes a free person of color. And shortly thereafter, in 1860, uh, she left and made her way to Baltimore where she hoped to uh, start a school. She actually taught other African-American women the dressmaking skills that she had herself, so she passed along this information to others. 
speculated that maybe there weren't enough black women who were able to afford to go to the school of hers. And they're not quite sure why she wasn't able to make a go of this school that she wanted in Baltimore. So she decided, since she wasn't doing well, she decided to go to, to D.C. And that's when her career really took off. She started making uh, gowns, because she was going to always have to cater to whether well-to-do women. Uh, she made gowns for Robert E. Lee. She actually worked for Jefferson Davis and his wife. She had quite a reputation. Got, she got introduced to, of course, Mary Todd Lincoln, and of course that's where she, her career was really cemented there. Uh, at one time, you know, she had her own business. She had 20 employees. She and Mary Todd became close. There was a certain amount of trust between them. Mary Todd Lincoln was also known to be a very difficult personality sometimes. She was not always liked in, uh, in society at the time or among their circle. So I, I think she was a rather difficult person to, to, to know. Mary Todd Lincoln was not the most popular of her first ladies. And one of the reasons why Elizabeth Keckley did want to write her this, this book, 30 Years a Slave, and talk about her White House experiences, is that she did want to, in a way, vindicate and support Mary Todd Lincoln. It backfired. I think because some historians say, well, she violated the conventions of the time and, and talking about these, these personal relationships that was unseemly. There were a lot of attempts to, to squash the book, basically, to, to get it out of circulation. As compared to now, of course, where we see this as, a, as an incredible primary uh, resource, as a, as a first-hand account of a person who was there in the room with the Lincolns, someone who had endured the, the horrors of slavery and who had managed to overcome this through incredible means and skill and talent. It is, is probably one of the most insightful of these types of narratives that we, that we see from this time period. She had a story to tell, right? She had a story to talk about the struggles that she overcame, the experiences as a, as a former enslaved uh, woman. A and then, like anyone who wants to tell these types of stories, she had a very unique story. She thought it would be well received. It would be like anyone that writes a story like this or writes a book like this, she just wanted her story to be told. I'm not surprised that a lot of people don't know about Elizabeth Keckley. I think they might know her more as the confidant of Mary Todd Lincoln than they know about her St. Louis years. What my people are to be, I can't say. Negroes have been fighting and dying for freedom since the first of us was a slave. And she was here for quite a while, 47 to 60, and she got her freedom here. She got her son's freedom here. Local history is, isn't really taught in the schools, from my understanding. And I think the focus is more on national history. But I think local history can be a lens in which to, to examine these, these larger issues. I think the neglect of local history often leaves, leaves a hole in your knowledge, like you talk about with Elizabeth Keckley. You know, we talk about Josephine Baker, who left here when she was 13 and never looked back, but we claim her. Uh, Maya Angelou, who left here as a, a very young child and never really came back, but we claim her <laughs> as a St. Louisan. And I think that, you know, Elizabeth Keckley was here longer than Josephine Baker or Maya Angelou or something, but, you know, so.